So, uh, good evening. Thank you for staying with me now. I know this is Saturday and it's Saturday evening. And I believe that you would love to be anywhere else instead of being here thinking. But for now, uh, I would like to share a bit on reinforcement learning for marketing channel optimization. Trust me, this will be interesting. But then for those who think that, wait, wait, there is a marketing there. Isn't it too commercial? Uh, let me clarify it this way. This use case, uh, I'm using it to make sure that the case that we are using in reinforcement learning can tackle the real business problem. And the way we solve this problem is quite broad so that you can apply this to many other uh, problem related to your industry. And by the end of this presentation, I will mention a bit on how uh, the other industries. So let's start. In the next four 30 minutes, I think, or 45 minutes, uh, we will discuss uh, this uh, topic. In the beginning, we will start to discuss on the background, why we discuss on marketing channel problem. And then we start to discuss on the enforcement learning about the age, and we will combine them all and check the result. And finally, I will give you a bit on the final remark. So, why marketing channel problem? I know this sounds a bit commercial, but if you read at the article, that tiny figure that, uh, the five, four, seven, it has a lot of zero behind it. So it's no longer a trivial problem. We need to be quite wise to manage that budget allocation. And not because it's about money, but because it's related on how our company will grow in the future. And it, in the same time, we want to make sure that the money is used well so that the financial stability of the company forward. I would like to share a bit on how it works. Basically, our marketers in Traveloka will define a particular level of budget and they will allocate that budget for a particular marketing channel and from that marketing channel, user will see the ads and that will be counted as impressions. And then, um, after the user clicks see the ads, some of them will be able to click the ads. And those will be counted as clicks. And after user clicks the ad, a fraction of them will be encouraged to buy the our flight ticket or hotel ticket. And those will be called as customer acquisition. And from customer acquisition, we get our money. If we see the problem earlier, we know that there are two different objectives, and it's completely different. In one side, uh, in this side, you see that marketers, if their KPI is solely on increasing customer acquisition, they will be very encouraged to pour out as, man, as much to increase customer acquisition. But there is another department called finance department, and they won't like it. We want to make sure that the budget that you pay to marketing channel agent is not infinite. We want to make sure that it's within our budget. So these two departments will keep uh, debating maybe all day long, but maybe they keep it like one hour. But uh, in general, these two objectives are quite in the opposite side of our company. So how to approach this problem? How to make sure that the budget that we give to marketing channel agent will be efficient while in the same time we can also manage to increase our customer acquisition? Let's take a step back on how to approach this problem by taking another analogy. Because my background is in supply chain and industrial engineering, let's take an analogy from manufacturer. Let's say that you have a manufacturing and you just buy this robotic arm. And your robotic arm, you want to make sure that this robotic arm can pick a box for you 
because paying people now is more expensive. We can approach implementing it in two different perspectives. That part is from optimization perspective, and this pink part will be in reinforcement learning perspective. In optimization perspective, it's conventional. You just make sure that uh, the mistakes in picking book how we will need to, to solve the action taken in time t, given that t will be from one to n. Let's imagine that the robotic arm in the position zero, and then by in time one, the robotic arm will move a bit, maybe 15 degrees, and maybe in ta time two, the robotic arm will move like maybe 30 degrees until time 10, for example, where that robotic arm is able to pick up the box. But that requires planning, and planning requires optimization. So let's imagine if we shift the box a bit, then we will need to rerun the optimization algorithm again to make sure that the action taken is, be, is able to fulfill our requirement. Let's move to the right part. It sounds easy. In reinforcement learning, we just teach the robotic arm, uh, pick the box. But then if the robotic arm take the wrong side, for example, let's say the box in the left side and then the robotic arm go moving, for, moving to the right side and you say to the robotic arm, mm -mm, it's wrong, you should move a bit to the left. So that's the basic of how reinforcement learning, learning can be implemented in uh, our analogy. Now, as we understand this analogy, let's think of the robotic arm as the decision that is required for the marketers to take in daily basis in terms of budget allocation. In day one, they need to allocate particular budget. And in day two, they also need to pa allocate particular budget until the end of the month, for example, where they want to make sure that the, the whole KPI, for example, the efficiency of their budget is optimized. So by understanding that limitation, we finally choose to use reinforcement learning. Why? If we look at this table, uh, there are three features. Equation to develop, computational efficiency, and new data. The first two, I think maybe we are kind of understand that optimization and reinforcement learning is uh, on the same ground. It's like I can take either optimization on reinforcement learning no matter whichever method that I will take. Because in optimization, uh, I will only need to think about objective and constraint. But in reinforcement learning, I still to think as well, but I just need to define reward function. Optimization efficiency. In optimization, it depends on how you formulate the problem. If the optimization problem is in term of linear and it's solvable, then it just takes maybe one or two seconds to solve the problem. But if the problem is nonlinear, then it will take some time to explore the solution space, and it's not good, especially when your marketers is very demanding. And then if you are using reinforcement learning, the training itself takes quite an effort, even for simple problem. But then what uh, the main reason of for us to use reinforcement learning is because of the third feature that I mentioned there. We are expecting that we will have new data in daily basis. And if we are implementing optimization here, uh, imagine that if we implement optimization, having new data in daily basis implies that we will have a new solution space in daily basis as well. And it will require us to keep rerunning the algorithm until you find the optimal solution. And that's quite tedious, actually. And that's why we are proposing to use reinforcement learning, because in the beginning, the training that takes a lot of effort will pay well, because it allows us to learn the parameter that can map between current state and the proper action that should be taken to maximize the reward. Uh, checking who is here from computer science. Okay, so you guys are smarter than me. Uh, we will talk a bit on reinforcement learning. I think you are already learning reinforcement learning in college. 
So if I say something wrong, please correct me because I know you are from computer science. Uh, this is just my simple understanding on what is reinforcement learning. There is an agent and there is environment. Agent will have a current state. And in the current state, agent will take an action. The action taken will be received in the environment. Here we take environment as our marketing channel problem. And from that action, environment will give response in term of reward. And that reward will allow the agent to move forward to the new state. So to understand the terms further, I think this one is for you who <coughs> haven't learned reinforcement learning. Here we have model. Model is used to describe the environment and policy is to describe how agent takes action. And there is also value function. And according to my understanding, there are a lot of ways to define value function in reinforcement learning because it describes the word of state and action. And I think this is important because the way you define the reward will define how the agent will take the action. And when you want to make sure that your agent takes a proper action, you will need to define value function carefully. And here, reward refers to the feedback based on the current state. A future reward will define cumulative discounted reward that I make this content reward part a bit bold and if you see the blue the blue part I make it smaller a bit because it's discounted and then there is also state value action value and advantage the last three I think is closely related state value is basically expected expectation of future reward given particular state and action value is the expectation of future reward given state and action. And the advantage is the difference between both state value and action value. To make it more intuitive, let's think that uh, if you have a higher action value, it implies that the decision taken given a particular action is better than having the average, uh, having the average state value. Because basically state value is the average of everything, but the action value is the average given particular state and action. Now, we want to learn more about the agent. So we will discuss this left part. We know that agent takes action, but then how does the agent learn to take good actions? There are a lot of ways for the agent to learn to take good actions. But here, what I want to explain is policy gradient method, in which basically <coughs> the agent, that part, will have a particular parameter that will be used for the policy to take action. And that action will be implemented in the environment. And the environment will result in particular value function. And from that particular value function, there will be an optimization process from which the value function will be used as the basis to optimize the parameter used in the policy. So that one is just my rough understanding. To be more specific, what we are using now is proximal policy optimization. It's basically a type of policy gradient method, except the three different block that I have colored with pink there. So we have agent, and it still has particular parameter, and it still has policy. We will produce, will use the parameter to produce action sampling instead of action itself. So if you imagine, because we are here facing a marketing budget problem, it means that our problem is in the continuous space. So taking a deterministic action decision will not work well. That's why we need an action sampling. And this action sampling will be implemented in the environment. And here, from the whole five uh, value function, we will use advantage to be the basis for the optimization. And we also implement sort of constraint to make sure that the update on the policy parameter will not be drastically different because a drastic update in PPO means that the algorithm will perform very unstable. 
So here, I would like to emphasize why we choose PPO, because there are four points that I mentioned there. Basically, the first point, maximize reward based on the policy, is the strength of PPO because it's a part of policy gradient method. Basically, it allows PPO to perf perform better in continuous space. And the use of action sampling allows better exploration. And the use of advantage allows a reduced variance. The fourth point, I think the key of understanding PPO, because if you see, uh, the basis of PPO is TRPO, which is a uh, trust region policy optimization. And I think trust region optimization is different from the usual gradient descent. I think we are understand. Okay. So trust region optimization is a different family of optimization. Usually in machine learning, we understand gradient descent as a part of line search method. Basically, it steps based on the gradient. But in trust region optimization, you are stepping within a certain trust region. So you do not want to uh, step further if it's outside your trust region. Because basically, you don't really trust outside uh, the trust region boundaries. And this is, impl is simplified in PPO by using clip mechanism. And this will help the algorithm to perform in a stable way so that it can help us during the training period. Now let's talk about the environment. The environment is in the that part. Something on real environment is expensive and it's less it's less likely for your company to pay for your experiments. What we do here is to replace this complicated part with a single model. It's a simplification, basically. We try to imitate what happens in the real environment uh, so that we can use that model to <coughs> sort of simulate what happens in the real world problem. But how, we, how can we create a model? There are two different approaches here. Uh, who have heard about recreation? Can raise your hand? Should I explain? Okay. So for those who hasn't understand, I think you can Google later. But recreation is basically the way for us to map between uh, input variable to make sure that we can produce a uh, output variable. So in the regression, we are treating data as random sample, and the parameter is assumed to be fixed. And the difference between data and the actual output will be treated as error. That's why there we are only see one line, because all is assumed to be fixed, and everything else is concluded as error. But uh, if we see that one particular line, we see that there is no uncertainty there because everything else is assumed as error. And we cannot use here this regression into our reinforcement algorithm. Because you see, you want to make sure that your agent is able to take uh, as adapt as possible. But then if you are teaching them with a uh, fixed input, then you will be sort of doing a very uh, non-productive things. So what we do here, we are looking at Bayesian regression. Uh, have anyone heard about Bayesian regression? No? Oh, cool. One. So Bayesian regression is basically, uh, I think, another way for us to approach modeling. Instead of treating parameter as fixed, we treat parameter as probabilistic. Uh, in the second point, we will need prior for that, but it's worth the effort because basically, if you see, there are a lot of lines because it's trying to capture the potential of uncertainty. And that's what's happened in our real world. And that's why we are using patient 
Sorry. So in the environment, we are using Bayesian regression. Why? Because even if the training takes effort, we are able to capture uncertainty and that allows us to teach the agent to take more smarter decision. And we will combine them all. So for combine, we have learned about reinforcement learning agent. We have learned about reinforcement learning environment. And we have also learned about Bayesian regression. But then how to put things into places? Uh, here I have created a sort of very simple map on how to combine those different things into one reinforcement learning that allows us to take smarter decision. Uh, we will not uh, learning it in sequence, but we will start with the modeling first, the first point, and then we start to learn about the beginning of the algorithm, which is in the second part, and then we will learn the third part, which is the final part of the algorithm. So we will start in the first point. Remember that in the modeling, we are using Bayesian regression. In Bayesian regression, instead of assuming that y equal to a times x plus b, we are assuming that y following particular distribution. And that's what happened here. Let's say that the y is impressions, and the x is action and holiday. Uh, we are treating impression as a sort of random variable that follows negative binomial distribution with parameter mu i and theta. And here, parameter mu i is defined as exponential of the long things inside the bracket. But if you see, that long part inside the bracket is sort of similar to linear regression, correct? So it's like one step forward uh, going from the usual linear regression that is not able to capture uncertainty to another met method called Bayesian regression that can capture uncertainty. <coughs> the same goes with link clicks. Basically, we assume that link clicks also following another distribution of negative binomial with particular parameter that following the regression equation inside the bracket. And in the end, we have reward which is defined as budget divided by link clicks, and we have a log function there and a minus sign there. And this will be an input for component three. If you remember, component three is the last part of the algorithm. Question, how to implement Bayesian regression? Why Python? Because it has an extensive documentation. Uh, it, it's quite reliable and it has a variety of functions. And for those who have read Python documentation, it's quite extensive and it is able to capture several functions that maybe is not available in other Bayesian Bayesian type for of library such as PyMC or it works. Next, uh, in the second part, this part, uh, I try to simplify it to make sure that it's similar to the one in policy gradient. But uh, in our implementation, we are modifying a bit to make sure that there is also a part of it that can help the agent to also predict well the reward that will be given by the environment. So instead of having policy network only, we will have also po value network. Policy network, as its name, uh, is a network that is used to sort of taking a good decision. And this can be done as policy network producing action parameter, and that action parameter is used for action sampling which will go to the first part of the our map, that computer part. And the value network will be used to predict state value, and this will go to the third part of our map. So value network and policy network, the input is only state. And if you want to make it more complicated, you can also take into account your action into the network. But that will be another cases. <coughs> And then this is the final combine our uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. We will calculate 
the advantage and also make sure that it will be optimized. How? Remember that for this third part, we have two different inputs. Reward from the first modeling in Python and also predicted state value, which is come from the second part of the map. And we can use those two to make sure that we have an optimized parameter for our value network. And in the same time, we can also use that to calculate the advantage and then make some adjustment by using importance weight and clip mechanism. <coughs> and we can use it to optimize policy network so that we can improve the parameter for policy network. Mm -hmm. Wait, seems the computer requires a weekend to... Okay, for the algorithm, we use PyTorch here. Why? Because this is still our initial study, so we are planning to develop it more, but for now, because this is initial study, we will require a lot of tests and error to check what happens uh, in the when it's exposed to real environment. But in short, we are using PyTorch because it's flexibility and it's also easy to debug and also for convenience, especially for Pyro. When you are understanding that you want to make sure that there is Bayesian mechanism that you want to involve in your algorithm, Having Pyro in your library is quite inconvenient because it allows us to explore probabilistic prog programming in our neural network. So the result, uh, if you see here, after 800 iteration, uh, the value loss quite converts. And importantly, the reward is also keeps increasing until it saturates at around 80, 800 iteration. And from there, I would like to continue to final remark. What we have done so far, we have make sure that we see the real world problem. And we use that real world problem to model the agent, the environment, to make sure that we have a good DRL model. And then we are training and checking the result of the model to make sure that it's capable to do a simple rational decision maker. But then what's next? In terms of model component, especially in the Python area, personally it's my interest to adding to add dependence to the other states and maybe also to add seasonality and trend. Because this initial study, we try to make it as simple as possible to make sure that it's really rational as it says. And in terms of other project, this is for you who thinks that marketing is too commercial. But uh, by understanding all of the framework that I have explained earlier, I think having this framework to be implemented in production planning, logistic, and industrial automation is also worth to try. Especially because if you think further, because in production planning and logistic, usually the one who implemented those three, uh, those production planning and logistics are human. And most of the time, they are quite flexible and adaptable to see what happens in the real environment. But in the same time, they also have bosses. And these bosses and their colleagues sometimes make them quite irrational. And I think it's worth to try to see what happens when we are developing a sort of smarter agent to make an automatic decision making so that we can at least guide the human who takes that real decision to make sure that decision is still rational along the way. So for reference, this is based on the compilation of the work of many people, uh, especially from the paper from Shulman and also a lot of tutorial from many other article. And for those who wants to learn more about Bayesian statistic, I'm suggesting the 10th point. And this is also the result of me asking so many people and I'm glad that they are not kicking me out yet. And also, 
the marketing team that allows me to explore this use case for PyCon. Thank you. Right, let's take some questions. Uh, you mentioned a uh, cut scan that you're talking about uh, optimization. Is that kind of a uh, visualization still? No, it's a constraint. So, so what's a cut scan? Oh, so. Let's say that you have a solution space th this big. But in PPO, you try to limit yourself. Also, let, let me start it again. You have this solution space this big, and you are in this point. And the optimization algorithm says, if you want your parameter to be optimal, you have to jump that far. But in PPO, you do not want to jump that far, because jumping that far will allow your algorithm to be unstable. So you are limiting yourself in a tiny cubic to make sure that you are not jumping that far, but jumping this small. Uh, and that constraint is implemented in a simplified way by using clip mechanism. Clip mechanism is basically just saying, I just allow myself to step as much as maybe one centimeter instead of one kilometer. So how do you figure out the boundary? Huh? The boundary that you don't want to jump beyond uh, The and boundary. boundary. Uh, so it's a hypertuning parameter in PPO. It's like an epsilon parameter where you allow one plus epsilon and one minus epsilon. Okay. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you for the talk. So I have several questions. Um, so actually, can you just go back to the this slide? This okay, this, this one. Uh, could you share with us uh, the training and the testing? Uh, I mean, the data structure, not the format. Okay. Uh, your, for example, Hello World uh, project. Okay, this is the way the data is presented. Basically, we have a table that contains historical data. And that historical data basically have an X in terms of action and holiday. Whether the action is taken is in the holiday or not. And we use it to train how many impression and how many link clicks and how many reward. But this model is used to make an imitation for the real environment. So it's used as the black box here. If you have read a bit on how to implement the enforcement learning, most of the time we are not using a sort of modeling. Uh, most of the time they use uh, import gym AI. You try to run a simple pendulum or to make sure that a car will move along the... But that sort of physical mechanism is already defined by the library, Jim AI. But here, we are replacing that library by using patient regression. And the second one is, uh, would you have any, any kind of a uh, hello world project like end-to-end -to, -end to follow this, this the framework? Good question. If you have to just share uh, the bit of our My code is quite messy right now. And I think because of the limitation of time, I haven't uh, submit my code to the HR. In the same time, I need to make sure that my business trip is reimbursed. So I think after this, you can email me, and maybe we, I can make sure that the code is quite neat for, to be shared. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. OK. All right, more questions? you compare this with the other Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. no, no. The one that we compare is the basic one. Because when we replace this with the, uh, when, we re we when we are intending to replace human with uh, this agent, we want, they will be very afraid, correct? So what we are comparing is what the real human will take, the decision it will take, and we compare it with the result of this uh, RL algorithm. And the difference is not that big. Uh, I'm not expecting for the RL algorithm to be in the most algorithm, but the difference is much less than 5%. So I think for the potential of having optimization, uh, for the for the potential of having make having to make it automated, I think it's worth 
in the future to try. Excuse me, can you? Model free. Model free. Model free. Uh, I think this one is model free. Model. Yeah, PPO is model free. The the chain the gym that you used for this, uh, the Bayesian model that you created for this, uh, was was specifically just looking at clicks and links. Uh, was just specifically looking at clicks on certain links. Uh, as far as to channel optimization in this context, like so, you're only in this case looking at specifically display ads on that. Am I correct? Or yeah. yeah. Okay. So for a particular marketing channel. We will have uh, data for marketing teams, and they are sort of giving us the collection of historical data. Or in day one, how much money they pay, and how much impression they get, and link clicks they get. It's sort of that data. More questions? Yeah. All right, so let's give a round of applause for the end.